By the 1950s, over half the population of all industrialized countries smoked. Smoking was so commonplace that it was hard to go anywhere, whether the movies, restaurants, even airplanes, without being surrounded by a huge cloud of smoke. At the time, no one saw anything wrong with this habit, but unbeknownst to the smokers of the world, this common and widespread vice was causing hundreds of thousands of people to develop horrific diseases and lose their lives. Meanwhile, the tobacco industry actively spread misinformation and propaganda in an attempt to keep their product and businesses alive while their customers unknowingly risk their health with every puff. It's the epitome of profits over people. It's the tobacco industry. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be talking about the industry of all industries, the tobacco industry. There is perhaps no better example of corporate greed, misleading consumers, and companies placing profits over people than this. Met with the information that their products were causing a massive health epidemic in the 1960s, the industry responded not with concern, apologies, or any effort to rectify the situation, but instead with a massive push to mislead consumers and deny their part in causing hundreds of thousands of people to lose their lives. Because of the sheer massive amount of information and events associated with the centuries long history of the industry, we obviously cannot cover everything in just one episode. Make sure to keep an eye out for more episodes and even some TikToks at Illuminati for all of that. And with all of that being said, let's get into this. Tobacco has been a part of multiple centuries for thousands and thousands of years. Researchers have found that the use of tobacco dates all the way back to the first century BC with the Mayan folks. At this point, at least according to archeologists, it was mostly used in sacred and religious ceremonies. Then as the Mayans gradually started to migrate or be pushed out of their own territories, if we're gonna be more accurately speaking, in about 470 to 630 AD, the use of tobacco for spiritual and medicinal purposes slowly started to spread to other native tribes. Rarely was tobacco used in the same manner we see today, either for enjoyment or social ties. Instead, it was smoked in sacred ceremonies or used to cure illnesses like asthma, earaches, fever, burns, and more. But that all began to change with Christopher Columbus. Now, Christopher Columbus is often credited with discovering tobacco, which as I just pointed out, he most certainly did not. Instead, he merely discovered that people were already using it. Now, Columbus first noted the use of tobacco in Cuba in the 1400s, and soon the explorers started experimenting with the plant for themselves and documenting its use and report back to Europe. At the time, the high levels of nicotine in the smoking and even chewing tobacco could act as hallucinogenics. Quickly, tobacco made its way into Europe and became one of the most prized crops and biggest businesses. It was mostly used by the highly elite. For instance, Queen Elizabeth I was an avid tobacco user, much to the king's dismay, but I'll talk about that more in just a couple minutes. Unfortunately, as the crop started to grow in importance, it also contributed heavily to the violent displacement of indigenous folks within the newly formed colonies in America. This was true specifically in Virginia and Maryland in the 1600s. In Jamestown alone, they exported over 2,300 pounds of tobacco to England between the years 1615 and 1616. But as I said, this all came at a price and that price just got steeper and increasingly violent as time went on. Horrifically, tobacco is also highly to blame for the massive expansion of indentured servitude in the colonies and later the growth of the slave trade. Tobacco was particularly labor intensive and took days of work to grow, take care of, and ship. Because of this, people in the colonies first heavily relied on indentured servants to grow the crop. According to the book, The Cigarette Century, which great book, by the way, it's estimated that one third of all English immigrants to America came because of the tobacco trade. Indentured servants were people who signed contracts, typically spanning anywhere from four to seven years in exchange for passage, lodging, food, etc., in the new colonies. The new life of indentured servants was often extremely restrictive and brutal, and people were often punished for running away or for women becoming pregnant with additional years of work being added to their contracts. However, some indentured servants were guaranteed land after their contracts ended, and some were able to become elite in the colonies. Because of this, as tobacco continued to grow as a commodity, indentured servitude became less of a viable option. Ultimately, many tobacco farmers, and by farmers, I mean the owners of the fields, turned to the slave trade. By 1700, black people who had been enslaved made up a majority of the tobacco labor force. For the next 100 years, tobacco would continue to grow as an industry and widely used product. By the American Civil War, tobacco had become so important to the United States economy that they imposed a tax on cigarettes in 1864. 
Then in the late 1800s, tobacco and cigarettes were truly revolutionized by entrepreneur James Buchanan Duke, also called Buck. Buck was considered to be the first successful cigarette entrepreneur and gained massive notoriety when he changed the game of tobacco in the 1880s with the invention of the Bon Sac machine, the first machine developed to roll cigarettes. Before this, cigarettes were hand rolled and sold as an expensive handmade luxury. Buck, with his groundbreaking invention, turned cigarettes into a cheap and mass producible commodity. He later founded the American Tobacco Company in 1890 and widely contributed to the massive growth of the American population smoking cigarettes and moving away from pipes and chewing tobacco. Meanwhile, in Britain, a manufacturer named Henry Willis started to use the machine to participate in the tobacco trade, which allowed him to become dominant in it within just a few years. Buck, seeing this, tried to enter the British market himself, and this led to a tobacco war between British and American companies, which caused a halt in manufacturing for a year. However, they eventually settled on an agreement that ended with British and American companies joining together to sell cigarettes to the rest of the world. Cigarettes grew even more when entering the 1900s, especially during the First World War. Surgeons praised cigarettes for helping the wounded relax and easing their pain. Additionally, it was easier for troops in the trenches to smoke cigarettes than it was to smoke pipes. Because of this, the United States government decided to join in with the tobacco industry to organize a constant supply of cigarettes to the troops. This would be the first time that cigarettes were included in soldiers' rations, and boy, did it make the companies a bunch of money. For instance, one company, Camel, sold over 20 billion cigarettes, largely due to their supply order from the United States government. Then during the Second World War, the US government again joined in with the United States tobacco industry when Britain had stopped their imports of US cigarettes. In response, the US government bought the volumes equivalent to the UK export market to protect its own farmers. In other words, the US government and ultimately the taxpayers bailed out tobacco farmers, which they had actually been doing since 1933 after the passage of the Agricultural Adjustment Act. This act provided a price support system for tobacco companies and farmers. Now in 1947, the United States government in partnership with the tobacco industry developed the Tobacco Associates. This was a marketing board to promote US cigarettes overseas. While it was technically a private organization, it was mandated by the government to symbolize the triumph of consumer capitalism at the beginning of the Cold War. It was in the 1940s and 50s that cigarettes would enter their so-called golden age. According to Britannica, by 1950, half of the population of industrialized countries smoked. In another article released by Nature Magazine, it was estimated that in the United States in 1955, more than half of all men and nearly one quarter of all women smoked. Smoking became a common and widely accepted behavior with people smoking in their offices, bars, movies, planes, and pretty much anywhere. Basically, anywhere there were people, there was smoking. Of course, at this point, no one was aware of the health implications of smoking. At least, it was not massively known by the general public. But slowly, that began to change. While some think that the knowledge that cigarettes can cause multiple diseases didn't occur until the 1960s, the concept that cigarettes and tobacco in general could be harmful to people's health had actually been suggested as early as the 1600s. After the passing of Queen Elizabeth I in 1604, remember mentioned she was an avid tobacco smoker at the time, King James I wrote a dissent letter on tobacco in England stating that smoking was, a custom loathsome to the eye, hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, dangerous to the lung. However, his warnings on the health risks of tobacco were also littered with harmful and extremely racist rhetoric. For example, part of his writing read, "'What honor or policy can move us to imitate the barbarous and beastly manners of the wild, godless, and slaving Indians, especially in so vile and stinking a costume?' And I don't know if it meant costume or custom, but it is written as costume. So while he did actually turn out to be right about the health impacts of tobacco, we can't really commend him on that since he coupled it with pretty horrific language. But he wasn't the only one to speak out against tobacco usage in the 1600s. In 1665, Samuel Pepys, a physician and researcher, announced that tobacco could be dangerous after a Royal Society experiment in which a cat died after being fed a drop of distilled oil of tobacco. Then over a hundred years later in 1791, a London physician named John Hill reported that snuff, chewing tobacco, had been linked to nasal cancers in certain cases. Despite these warnings, even by some extremely powerful people, the tobacco industry flourished and these concerns were quickly swept under the rug. Perhaps because all of the money and extreme power the tobacco industry had brought both the United States and Europe. Additionally, I feel like it's incredibly interesting and important to remember that the United States and British governments had huge ties to the tobacco industry since the late 1800s. Just 
a little something to, I don't know, keep in mind. However, this all started to change in the 1950s and throughout the late 1960s when various health entities began to publish reports about the links between tobacco products and cancer. In 1950, researchers Dr. Ernest L. Widener and Evarts A. Graham released a study that showed smokers had a greater risk of developing lung cancer than non-smokers. Their results were published in the New York Times, Reader's Digest, and even Life. But despite the widespread publication of their findings, they remained widely ignored by the public, likely due to the physical addiction to cigarettes, the advertising by the tobacco industry, and their constant denial. But again, we will return to that. In 1956, the Surgeon General in the United States, Leroy E. Burney, appointed a scientific group to study the impact of smoking on health. One year later, Bernie released a statement saying, quote, it is clear there is an increasing and consistent body of evidence that excessive cigarette smoking is one of the causative factors in lung cancer. Again, these early warnings were just widely ignored by the general public though. A few years later, the Royal College of Physicians released a report that again, linked smoking to lung cancer. Then as more and more evidence began to come out linking smoking to lung cancer and other diseases, the United States government formed a task force specifically geared to study the impact of smoking on health. After the approval for the committee from President Kennedy, they would go on to release the groundbreaking Surgeon General Report in 1964. Like the others, the report found a resounding connection between smoking and lung cancer. This would be the first time that the federal government specifically declared that tobacco use was becoming an epidemic. In addition to finding a link between smoking and lung cancer, the 1964 Surgeon General Report also found that smoking could lead to chronic bronchitis, heart disease, and health risks for pregnant women who smoked and their infants. Which by the way, as a precursor to the next section about industry denial, the CEO of Phillips Morris, one of the biggest tobacco companies in the world at the time, said the risks for infants were perfectly fine because, and I quote, some women would prefer having small babies. So that's, just an example of what people were dealing with at the time. From there, the news of how detrimental smoking was to public health just continued to grow and become more widespread. By 1971, researchers even began to point out that cigarettes were in fact addictive and not merely a habit as it was thought previously. Then the tobacco industry took another hit when in 1972, the Surgeon General reported that environmental tobacco smoke, otherwise known as secondhand smoke or passive smoke was also a health risk to non-smokers. So with all this information coming out about the health effects of smoking, how did the tobacco industry respond? How did so many people continue smoking? Well, the tobacco industry fell back on massively spreading misinformation and even developing their own research committee to develop and spread false information about tobacco disguised as real science. As reports about the detrimental effects of smoking on people's health began rolling in, the tobacco industry responded by developing the Tobacco Industry Research Committee. And that's right, they formed a research group to study themselves. That doesn't have any history of going disastrously wrong, does it? I'm kidding, of course, because of course this has huge implications. In December, 1953, Paul M. Hahn, the president of the American Tobacco Company organized a meeting with a group of executives from the biggest companies in the United States, along with public relations company, Hill and Knowlton. Ironically, they later worked with the American Heart Association in 2004, but that's just an interesting little tidbit. The meeting took place at the Plaza Hotel in New York City and sought to answer just one question. How was the tobacco industry going to respond to the new research coming out about their product and horrific diseases like cancer and heart disease that they were causing? Then just like that, in the comfort of a hotel, in a cigar and cigarette smoke-filled room, I'm sure, the Tobacco Industry Research Committee was established. One year later, they released the Frank Statement. This statement had a few key points. First, it claimed there was no agreement among authorities about the cause of lung cancer. They also claimed that there was no proof that cigarette smoking was a cause of lung cancer and that the statistics being released could apply with equal to any of many other aspects of modern life. Then of course, they described how their newly developed research committee would address their growing concerns over the link of smoking and health issues. They said their newly formed group would be full of scientists with an unimpeachable integrity and national repute who were all to study all phases of tobacco use and health. However, that's not at all what happened. Instead, the research committee worked to develop and disseminate false research that adamantly avoided admitting that smoking was in any way linked to health complications. 
Dr. Alan M. Brandt describes the purpose of this committee beautifully in their article, Inventing Conflicts of Interest, a History of Tobacco Industry Tactics, when they wrote, if science had historically been dedicated to the making of new facts, the industry campaign now sought to develop specific strategies to unmake a scientific fact. Basically, the tobacco industry, backed by some of the most powerful companies in the world like Philip Morris, joined together to find some of the most skeptical and vocal doctors and scientists, most of them of course being smokers, to create false and misleading scientific studies that could debate the others that linked smoking to cancer. In fact, they specifically named the committee with the word research in it to mislead consumers since they believe that the word research was needed in the name to give weight and added credence to the committee's statements. This committee was so convincing, in fact, that they gained academic support and were even able to receive grants for their false research. The research committee ended up spending over $300 million over 40 years to convince the public that many independent and responsible scientists continued to voice opposition to the findings that cigarettes were linked to deadly diseases. Meanwhile, in reality, most physicians and researchers were on the side of actual science. The only ones that seemed to disagree were those tied in with TIRC. Not only did the industry develop a research council, but it also created the Tobacco Institute. The Tobacco Institute was used to lobby the government, disseminate information, and print news related to the Tobacco Research Council's so-called findings. The Tobacco Institute was funded by 12 companies and had an estimated budget of over $20 million, all used for the purpose of lobbying Congress to avoid regulations, distribute propaganda, and of course, pay their 50 employees. The Institute adamantly fought against regulation by supporting Congress members through their PAC or political action committee and by arguing that the tobacco industry was a vital aspect of the United States economy. They also helped to promote the lie about safer cigarettes that the tobacco industry adamantly promoted after the Surgeon General's findings. Now, what exactly were these safer cigarettes they were referring to? Well, let me tell you. As warnings regarding smoking and health risks kept rolling in, one of the strategies utilized by the industry was to try and promote and create healthy cigarettes. And spoiler note, um, they don't exist. But still, these memos from the industry's public relations team titled Industry Response to the Cigarette and Health Controversy urged companies to promote more filter brands and brands with lower tar delivery. The thinking was that these could be advertised as being safer and gave the illusion of being healthier cigarettes to smokers, despite the industry knowing full well they were not. The race to produce these types of cigarettes and advertise them to the public became known as the tar derbies and was just another strategy used by the industry to maintain a good public image. However, while they went through this strategy of healthier cigarettes, quotes all around healthier, by the way, they actually ended up making cigarettes more addictive. In the late 1960s, the Philip Morris company discovered that adding ammonia to cigarettes created something called free nicotine. Basically, it convinced the brain that you were getting more nicotine than you actually were, and the effects were felt in seconds. After Philip Morris's success, the other companies started to follow suit. So as they advertised these healthier cigarettes, they did so knowing they were actually not safer than before and becoming outrageously more addictive. Then as passive smoking, otherwise known as secondhand smoke, was found to also be a danger to non-smokers health, the tobacco industry doubled down and became even more adamant that smoking couldn't cause any health issues. In 1978, a market research organization actually advised the tobacco industry that passive smoking was the most dangerous development to the viability of the tobacco industry that has yet occurred. From there, they started to rapidly recruit academics, scientists, lawyers, and public relations specialists in an attempt to fight the ever-growing amount of research, policies, and eventual lawsuits that they would have come their way. And that came in handy as by the late 60s and 70s, the tobacco industry would face an onslaught of each. By the time the first report came out about cigarettes and other tobacco products being linked to cancer and heart disease, smoking was incredibly commonplace. So people against smoking or attempting to notify the population of the concerning news were in for a massive fight, not only with the tobacco industry themselves, but their millions of customers. One of the first steps taken by organizations attempting to stop or at the very least weaken the tobacco industry was to out advertise them. Advertising had become a massive part of the business. So in an attempt to address this, nonprofit organizations in certain parts of the US government began to adamantly fight against tobacco advertisements. In 1967, after the groundbreaking 1964 Surgeon General's report, the Smoking Action and Health Organization, ASH, began working to weaken the tobacco industry. And there's gotta be a pun in there somewhere. I'm just, my brain's just not working today. Ash petitioned the Federal Communications Commission stating that they were required to devote free airtime to anti-smoking advertisements on radio and television. 
they were successful. And studies have actually found that these anti-smoking advertisements severely lessen the number of smokers in the United States. From 1967 to 1970, anti-smoking ads received roughly 75 million in free advertising. This was compared to the industry's 1 billion in spending, but it did still make a difference. However, at this point, the tobacco industry was still not going to let people come in and ruin their kingdom. So they asked Congress to just remove any advertisements related to cigarettes on television or radio. They obliged and cigarette advertising was officially banned in 1969 with the Public Health Cigarette Smoking Act. And yes, you did hear that correct. It was the tobacco industry that caused their advertisements to be discontinued. And that seems so wrong, right? That doesn't seem like what they would want. Well, as it turns out, it wasn't so crazy. With all advertisements concerning cigarettes becoming banned, that meant anti-smoking ads were banned too. Plus, the companies could still use advertisements on billboards too. It wasn't like their advertisement completely disappeared. Unfortunately, this led to both an increase in cigarette consumers and it saved the industry some money, which it could use elsewhere, like to fight major lawsuits or political discourse. In addition to banning advertising, the Public Health Cigarette Smoking Act also required cigarette packages to have the label stating, warning, the Surgeon General has determined that cigarette smoking is dangerous to your health. Unfortunately, these warnings were not particularly helpful. Now, slowly, as more evidence regarding smoking and secondhand smoke being linked to various forms of health concerns like lung cancer, heart issues, and severe risk to pregnancy, the rules involving smoking in the United States began to also change. Only one year after the Surgeon General reported that secondhand smoke put non-smokers at risk, Arizona became the first state to begin restricting smoking in public areas. Then in perhaps the biggest hit to the tobacco industry, the United States government started to follow suit. The government started to limit and regulate smoking in government buildings after years of warnings about the dangers of smoking and passive smoke. Then in 1975, the army and Navy stopped providing cigarettes in the rations for service members. As many of you remember from our background earlier, this was a huge deal to the tobacco industry. Camel in particular made a massive amount of money and I'm talking billions of dollars through their government contract. So losing this asset was a huge blow to the industry. And that little warning on cigarette cartons that I talked about just a second ago, as I said, it turns out those didn't work super well. In 1981, the FTC reported to Congress that the past health warning label had little effect on public knowledge and attitudes about smoking. In response, Congress passed the Comprehensive Smoking Education Act in 1984, which required four additional and more specific warnings to be placed on cigarette packages. These new warnings explicitly stated that smoking caused lung cancer, heart disease, and emphysia. And they additionally had to add that it may complicate pregnancy. They also state that smoking while pregnant could result in fetal injury, premature birth, and low birth weight. Lastly, they explicitly said that cigarette smoke contains carbon monoxide. But despite all the new regulations and rules revolving around smoking both at state and federal levels, the tobacco companies pushed on. That is, until the lawsuits came into play. And before we continue on to take a look at the lawsuits involving the tobacco industry, let's just take a quick break to thank today's sponsors. Thanks to 7% inflation, everything costs a gazillion dollars right now. So it's a relief to find savings where you can, and you can find it with Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile is the first wireless company to sell online only, and their lack of overhead translates into serious savings for you. And when I say serious savings, I mean serious. Their plans start at just $15 a month and all their plans come with unlimited talk, text, and high-speed data all delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. With Mint Mobile, you can choose the amount of data that's right for you and stop paying for data you don't use. I've been using Mint Mobile now for a year and a half. Maybe we're getting close to two years at this point and I have had zero problems. It's actually been kind of shocking. The bill is easy to control and maintain through their app and pay and upgrade or downgrade depending what I'm doing. And there's literally no issues ever. It's kind of shocking that it's so good. Like why isn't everyone doing this? Anyway, to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, make sure you go to mintmobile.com slash casket. That's mintmobile.com slash casket. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash casket. It seems like we've all been really focused on sleeping lately as well too, because no one is sleeping well. But no matter how many tinctures you might buy, nothing helps more than just getting a better mattress. That's why it's worth getting a purple mattress. Only Purple mattresses have the Gel Flex Grid, which is a super stretchy, ultra squishy material that adapts and flexes around pressure points and doesn't retain heat. Might I add, 
doesn't retain heat. You sleep nice and cool on this thing all night. The Flex grid supports your back and legs, yet also cushions your shoulders, neck, and hips. Since switching to a purple mattress, I've noticed that Casper, which as you guys know, is a Samoyed who is an Arctic sledding dog, so he needs to maintain cool temperatures. He's been sleeping on the corner of the purple mattress with me. So I assume it most certainly keeps him cool as well, which makes me happy. And you can try your purple mattress risk-free with free returns and shipping. Financing is available too. So getting a great night's sleep starts with having a great mattress. So get a purple mattress. Make sure you go to purple.com slash casket and use code casket. For a limited time, you can get 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash casket, code casket for 10% off any order of $200 or more. That's purple.com slash casket, promo code casket, terms apply. In the late 1950s and the 1960s, after the truth about cigarettes slowly trickled its way into public knowledge, individual lawsuits started streaming in. At this point, lawsuits were mostly brought by individual people who were smokers who later developed lung cancer. In them, they accused tobacco companies of a few key things. They claimed that the tobacco industry were negligent manufacturers, meaning that they failed to act with reasonable care in making and marketing cigarettes, which of course they did. I mean, remember, multiple companies were caught adding ammonia to their cigarettes to make their product more addictive. But that wasn't found out until years after these first lawsuits. They also claimed that the tobacco industry committed product liability and negligent advertising, which means they marketed a product that was unfit to use and failed to warn consumers of the risks of smoking cigarettes. And of course, as we know now, they absolutely did. All of these added up to the tobacco industry being accused of fraud. Considering they adamantly lied about the health of their cigarettes and repeatedly denied any harm associated with smoking, that would definitely constitute fraud. But unfortunately, the tobacco industry saw these lawsuits coming. And instead of simply settling and hoping the lawsuits would quietly disappear, they responded with an aggressive defense of their products. With the power of some of the best lawyers in the United States, the tobacco industry went on a massive campaign to fight the allegations they relied heavily on the same talking points that had been released by the Frank Statement to argue against the plaintiff's claims. Basically, they denied that cigarettes were bad for people and claimed that anyone who just happened to get cancer or happened to have been a smoker didn't get sick because of smoking. They insinuated that it clearly had to be for some other reason that all these smokers were getting sick. Unfortunately, the tobacco industry essentially crushed its competition in almost all of these early lawsuits. They won easily and continued refusing to provide any settlements to the people they had given deadly and horrific diseases to. But that began to change in the 1980s. In one of the most important lawsuits of the 1980s, Cipollini v. Liggett, the husband of Rose Cipollini, sued the Liggett group for knowing that cigarettes were both addictive and caused lung cancer, leading to Rose's death. Originally, he won and was awarded $400,000. But as the case moved to appeal, the decision was reversed. But the case was still incredibly important and it was the first time anyone had gotten close to winning anything against this industry. The 1990s would become some of the most detrimental years for the tobacco industry. This is because this is when the state started to become involved. In 1994, Mississippi began the first state to sue the tobacco industry. The lawsuit went after 13 different tobacco companies and sought reimbursement for the cost of Medicaid and other medical programs provided by the state that supported victims of smoking-related illnesses. The Mississippi Attorney General at the time, Mike Moore said, "'This lawsuit is premised on a simple notion. "'You cause the health crises, you pay for it.'" Despite the supreme confidence from the state that the lawsuit would be successful, the tobacco industry and their lawyers seem equally as confident and for good reason. Until this point, they had never had to pay any settlements for their wide variety of lawsuits. But this one was different, being the first of its kind where a government entity went after the industry giants. After three years, Mississippi came back with a shocking victory, or at least partial victory, as they settled the suit with the industry. However, the biggest impact of the first lawsuit was the tidal wave of states that followed their lead and decided to go after the industry. 46 states eventually sued the tobacco industry in a joint lawsuit while Florida, Texas, and Minnesota sued and settled with the tobacco industry in the 1990s for an undisclosed amount. The remaining 46 states, the District of Columbia and five other US territories participated in what became the largest civil litigation settlement in US history. 
The massive lawsuit similar to the Mississippi lawsuit requested that the tobacco industry pays for the medical services provided by the states and therefore the taxpayers for smoking related health implications. In 1998, the states reached an outstanding victory when four of the largest tobacco companies, including Philip Morris, R.J. Reynolds, Brown and Williamson, and Lauriard, agreed what was dubbed the Master Settlement. The Master Settlement totaled roughly $206 billion, which is still being paid out to this day and will continue to be paid until 2025. In addition to the astonishingly huge monetary fee, the Master Settlement also included a few other provisions for the tobacco industry. First, the settlement required that an independent organization be developed and paid for by the tobacco industry that prevented tobacco use, which became the Truth Initiative. It also required tobacco companies to release their internal documents and disband the Tobacco Institute, which in turn led to a wider understanding of just how much the industry knew about the health concerns and addiction and the shocking precautions they took to avoid this knowledge from becoming public. Lastly, the agreement addressed the advertisement of cigarettes and other tobacco products, including limiting advertising to people under 18, eliminating the use of cartoons, and forbidding the use of brand names as merchandise. Since the signing of the master settlement, 40 other companies have joined through the years. However, this massive settlement would not be the end of legal battles for the tobacco industry. In 1999, only one year after the master settlement agreement absolutely rocked the tobacco industry, they faced yet another massive legal battle, this time against the United States Justice Department. The Justice Department argued that the industry had lied and defrauded American citizens by claiming that cigarettes were safe, were not addictive, and that low tar cigarettes were not harmful. They even charged them with racketeering, using a business for illegal acts or running a business through illegal activity, which had usually been reserved for like mob cases at the time, so there's that. Six years after the lawsuit was filed, the American Cancer Society and other major plaintiffs joined in. Then finally, in 2006, Judge Gladys Kessler ruled in the plaintiff's favor, agreeing that the tobacco companies had been lying to their consumers. As part of Judge Kessler's ruling, tobacco companies were finally forced to admit that they had lied in the past and had known that cigarettes and other tobacco products were dangerous. After over 50 years of constant denial and sneaky tactics, they would finally have to admit what they had done publicly. To do this, tobacco companies were required to release advertisements in newspapers and on television. Additionally, they were required to put notices on packets of cigarettes and on their own website saying that they had lied. While the various campaigns, lawsuits, and regulations on the tobacco industry certainly helped, I'm sure as you know, smoking has not been completely eradicated and neither have the diseases it causes. The regulations and education on just how dangerous smoking is have helped radically decrease the number of people who do smoke in the United States. In the 1950s, about half of all Americans smoked. Now, only about 22% of adult men and 18% of adult women are smokers but that's still a lot of people. According to the CDC, smoking kills approximately 480,000 Americans every year. Additionally, the United States spends at least $300 billion every single year on smoking related illness. So while that over $200 billion settlement may sound like it was making a major dent, it really isn't making as big of a difference as we might think. Some researchers and business analysts are hopeful that smoking could be practically non-existent in the United States by 2046, but that's just an estimation. And it also doesn't necessarily account for new forms of smoking we're seeing to pop up, like vaping, for example. But we are going to talk about that more on a different day because Juul is absolutely on my radar, so I assure you it will be covered very soon. But as I said, the tobacco industry is huge and its history is extensive and it's way too much to cover in just one episode. So make sure to keep your ears and eyes open because we will be talking about it more in the future as we continue to gather evidence to continue this new series about the tobacco industry. But with that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. Thank you so much for joining me here today. And thank you, of course, to all the great patrons that support us over on patreon.com and everyone who supports us by listening or watching these episodes. You are all truly amazing and allow us to continue to research and bring new and sometimes horrific details to the light. Thank you so much for tuning in today and we'll see you in the next one. Bye. 